you tell me what happened to Mark Holden's photograph I put in here for safekeeping? There's Dolph Holden there. Dolph. Oh, wow. oh yeah, look, that's that's him. And what were that? How come they were there? Well, we were with that with Holden. Oh, so what, what year was that? Combined. Well, the year Mervyn was born. Sixty years ago. 1938. Um, you know, it wasn't such a, an uncommon thing for circuses to combine in the old days. Mm. That joint merge mm. and then, you know, go for a run and then they'd say, oh, we'll split up, I want to go this way. And that circus might merge with another one and go somewhere else. You know, it happens quite often. There were uh, 10 or 11 children of the Holden clan and uh, all great performers and Adolphus Holden uh, only had one leg and uh, that did not impair his ability as a circus artist in any way, shape or form. Uh, you would think it would uh, help to throw him off balance, uh, being minus one leg from the knee down, uh, but it didn't. They used to work under the name of the Flying Gordons. They did a death-defying uh, triple horizontal bar act as it is now, and they're very rare, not seen very much uh, these days. And Holden Circus was transported by uh, uh, mule teams, and uh, also motorisation was creeping in to a large extent then. Old Pop Holden, that was old Adolphus Holden, was a grand old man, and he had this uh, large herd of mules and uh, they were all very, very strangely named. He called them all after their different condiments like salt, pepper, cayenne, They're running right through the whole gamut. Beautiful Melbourne day. Yeah, that's right. Hey, buddy. Hey, 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 Circus started in uh, 1892. They had their own band of trumpets and banjo and the bass drum there, of course. And then they used to pile onto the bandwagon and parade the town with the circus band. All the breakups and the makeups, all the vices we take up, somehow turn into a beautiful sound. All the grit and the glory of the never story every chord is lifting me ten thousand miles off the ground
stars And this old guitar And this old guitar about to make her first appearance on the flying trapeze to the circus begun by her great-great-great-grandfather 150 years ago. Is he nervous? No. Why? I know it's just my life, I think. Hello? Are you nervous? No. Why not? Well, I've been doing it for a few years. It's kind of weird. So what you're teaching is what your parents taught you? That's right. I can only teach the kids what, what I know. Basically, everything I know comes from, you know, the families, you know, so... Double cut this time. Good boy! They taught me, uh... Tumbling, bareback riding, Roman rings, trampoline, flying. What happens when you're too old to the peace? Will you stay with the circus then? Oh, I can do something. You wouldn't want to go to any other life. <laughs> so what do you do in the circus nowadays? I've retired because flying was my life. And all I do now is practice and keep strong. But in the circus, it's like you, you go from one thing into another thing. There's never nothing to do. Do you think it's um, in any way ironical that Peppy has now got Michelle? It's very gratifying to me to know that this has happened because you can't predict what will happen. He might have had a partner that was a horse rider or just wanted to be a housewife or something. And Michelle has just fitted in, in perfect like there was a little slot made for her. But she's got really delicate hands. My sister's and <laughs> Becky's hands are okay, aren't they? Yeah, they're pretty rough. Becky. They fly, but their hands are callous, but they don't tend to rip open. I tear, like sure. especially in the heat when there's a mountain. They're eight. normal hands. They'll just go and get them and come out and there's blood running down my hand. Mm. Painful. But she still smiles. And tonight, 
Jan stands nervously 150 feet above the sawdust on the threshold of a new era as Australia's youngest trapeze artist. A success. And so Jan becomes the new member of the Flying Ash. It's something you want to do, you have to do, and you, you know, I've seen other ways of life. I mean, as Chantel, I've, I've travelled. I don't know. I don't think there's anything better you could do. So you'll never leave the circus? No. You'll always be a circus girl. And then they go out and fly on the trapeze. The women of the circus are absolutely amazing individuals. For some reason, when you look in the Ashton line, when you look in the Holden line, the women are beautiful, talented and strong. Were you born into the circus? Oh yes, I was born into show business. My mum and dad worked the theatres as well as circuits and uh, mum walked a tight wire on stage the night before I was born. Wow. So you couldn't get much closer to show business than that. 
<laughs> but I had a good childhood, you know. I wouldn't change it for anything. Action Mighty Circus, Australia's greatest, Kevin the Mist, Thrills of Laughter. You do it for people that come and thank you for the entertainment for the night, that they had a good time. You do it because your family's all together um, and it's what you've been doing for the last, since the day you were born. Dad brought us up to learn everything, you know, from performing in the ring, announcing, um, publicity, pr like the promotions, and also the business side of the running and administration of the business as well. Most of us work something, you know, some other extra bit. People say, well, how do you do that? You know, you're in there doing the, in your high heels and up on the trapeze and then you're out here selling fairy floss or, or orange or snow cones. But most, I think most Australian circus families do exactly what we're doing. Mum's out there defrosting donuts in between the acts. <laughs> Features Ashton Circus. If the show of surprises, I think you're going to enjoy it. Come on, Doug and Phyllis Ashton in the menuet. Our beautiful costumes, cream satin wool. And who's that? Who's doing it? Dougie and I. Oh, that's you and Doug. Brilliant. Some nights the horses slip and Phyllis would pull the wig over my eyes. I couldn't see anybody. <laughs> <laughs> The present queen of the trapeze in Ashton's is Nikki, a former ballet dancer. Two years ago, she fell during this act and broke her spine, wrist and ribs and lost one kidney from internal damage. Three months later, she was back on the trapeze. We asked her if she felt nervous when she went back. I was a little bit because well, I don't think I, I wasn't as sure of myself. I didn't have any confidence that gradually builds up, you know, and when I get further ahead and do harder tricks and things. What's the future hold for you, Nikki, as the queen of the trapeze? Well, um, there's not many girls that are flying to pose now that, who want to excel in the hardest sort of tricks by bubbles and um, forwards out of the bar and things like that. But if I practice up on those, you could probably get a, a job overseas or a tour overseas. Just experience. You don't really know what standard of performer you are, actually, until you're older, and, until I look back now. You don't know if you're good or bad. With Mervyn and myself, we both have the circus coming first, and it always has. And it really shouldn't be quite like that. I think you should have the family first and then the circus. But I love the circus. And what's it like being a fully-fledged circus performer at the age of 13? It's terrific. <laughs> what do you feel when you get up on bareback and in front of all those people? Do you feel scared or what? Uh, no, well the first time I went in I did, but after the second or third time you just, just don't take any notice of the people, just l think it's like practice, you see.
wanted to go on that flying gear so bad. She fell in love with the trapeze and I think I came second. Aerial acrobatics on the solo trapeze. Becky Ashton. Ago. I was 14 or 15 at the time. My dad um, bought an old Ensign camera from Kodak um, in uh, Queen Street in Brisbane. Dad's idea was, was to start recording our tours around the country. You know, we weren't tourists, we were travelling circus people. And of course, our main priority was to get the circus from town to town, get the tent up and perform. I'm 
travel by train, Lord, I'm gonna travel by train. Don't wanna get caught in the rain, Lord, don't wanna get caught out again. I'm gonna leave here today. Turning back, cause I'm right on track, and I'm gonna travel by train.
All the Holdens in this program are descendants of Samuel Holden, who came to Indented Head near Geelong in 1852 on the good ship Benny with his wife Margaret, and he busted out the farms all around Indented Head. This was back-breaking work, but successful. These are poor Irish farmers who turn up and have access to this gorgeous country, beautiful, beautiful country. There's a terrific letter from John Holden in 1870 where he says that he grew a wheat crop and he got a thousand pounds. He got a thousand pounds for one crop. And he said he treated everybody concerned to a great night. <laughs> After about 10 years, Samuel Holden was about 45 and he now had 11 kids. Um, they all had farms. He got gold fever and for the next 20 years he would go back and forth to the gold fields and then come back to the ballerine expecting to be fed and to recuperate. But he'd go into drunken rages and one time he actually burnt down one of his son's crops in the field. We know this story because there was an inquest into his death and the inquest question was, was the blow to the back of his head that he died from, was that at the hands of his own sons? Ultimately, the coroner found that there was no evidence of ill usage from members of his own family. He was a rambling man. He was a rambling man. He was a rambling man. He went dancing with the devil. He was a rambling man. When you're actually out on country and start to look, country will speak to you and tell you about itself. The Ballerine region is quite interesting because they only had enough people to live off the land that was there. So they didn't overpopulate an area. They just lived so that the, the environment could sustain them. And it was a great environment out there. The blacks were coming. A bell would ring and, and would let people know that the blacks were coming and, and they were heading down to the coast. And this would be a signal for for the unscrupulous ones to to use that as a way of, of getting rid of some of the Aboriginal people. So they'd ring that bell and then every other bell would ring from there on in all the way down to Queensland. The blacks are coming. Be prepared. They might have to be out there to kill you. These sorts of things. But it wasn't so. They were just on their seasonal track a lot of times. It was interesting history, you know, a lot of a lot of massacres in and around Geelong area. By you know, 1868 there was none. What happened to them all? Um, well, a lot were, you know, obviously because of dispossession of the land and the massacres and, and things like that. Um, and of course the common cold and the tuberculosis and those sort of diseases came along and uh, they just died off. So within 90 years of Captain Cook landing in Australia, there was no Wathrong people, all gone. i 
cross the river of blood They call it a gunpowder warning But the thousands of beers didn't make a sound I'm convincing ground And the bell was ringing on one tree hill And the bell was ringing out fire and will And the bell was ringing And the people were running From the sound That's the sort of attitudes that, that were back then and attitudes are slowly changing, but not that quick, which is a shame. When Ashton's joined Holden's was when they had the elephants. Barry and I, we had the uh, ponies, monkeys, camels. It's how you treat them and that, you know, when they get to know you. You can hear, you know, the monkeys making their sound during the night and you'd say, oh, something's up and out of bed again and you'd go down and make sure everything's right, okay. Or they might need a bit of feed, put a bit of feed in to keep them happy during the night or whatever and you'd be on call all hours. That's how they used to do their cooking. See, see the cooking outside on the uh, open fire. There's another cooking one outside, all around the. That's her see all, all done outside. That's Barry, my brother, with the uh, guitar. We used to do a lot of um, the indigenous, the the you know the um, Aboriginal people. Yeah, just meet them, meet them along the way, you know, which, wherever we went. They'd all, all come around to see us again, meet us, greet us. They loved us. We did ride around Australia, everywhere, up all the states, all the towns along the way. Years ago, uh, it'd be all one-nighters. You yeah, one, you know, put it up, take everything to the next town. Now, the circus can stay in a, in a town for a month. But in those days, we used to just do one one town, then on to the next. And on to the next and on to the next. Now, now you couldn't do it because too too big to move now. With all these chains and cables and everything else. 
you've got to be an engineer. As a kid, when, when I used to see them go into the circus ring, he'd have his clown person there, you know, and my father would be here and the clown would be over there. He, he'd walk in with a wine bottle, you know, a wine bottle. He'd walk into the ring like that and his father would be <laughs> cracking the whips and all that type of thing. And, uh, and he'd, he'd be saying, well, I need, I need, I need, a, I need, a, I need a drink, you know. But he can't get the top off, off his wine bottle so he can have a, you know, a good swig. 
So he's standing, he's standing here like that, and he's going like this, like, I got cut out. What am I going to do? My father would go like that with the whip and knock the cork out of the bottle, like that. Then he'd take a nice big swing. This is where I got it from. And out would come the flame. And that's, that's where it used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, him being the bombo, that's what it was called, the bombo act. And then that's where I, when I used to see him, I'd be watching. Oh, one day I'm going to do that. It's a little bit better, but not very much, but still, got to be thankful for small mercies. Put a one in front of that now, <laughs> make it look better. Yeah. <laughs> Will that pay fuel to the next town? <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> That's done for the night. The next town looks real good. The ground's good, and I think the bookings are better. So we're hoping to get a good crowd there. And the next town, and the next one, the next one. <laughs> All of them. Got to keep trying, haven't you? The mallets will unpack the tent city, and the big top will billow down. The trucks, the cages, the caravans and the carriages will rumble off to another town and another show. And then...
Practically everyone who performs in the circus has appeared with a clown. Legend has it that a great clown must have a broken heart. We asked Joe, the leading clown in Ashton Circus, if the legend is true. Uh, I think, uh, yes, in, in, in a way it has to be to, as a, to be a good clown, you'd have to be sort of a philosopher. It's never worried me broken hearts or that, you go in and do what you've got to do and as I say, if you don't get a laugh, you have a broken heart. Well, I don't think it's easy to 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 make people laugh. If, you, if, you, if you're doing a trapeze act and you learn the triple, you've solved that. You, you go and do that every night and, and regardless, you do the triple somersault. With clowning, you go in tonight and you get a big laugh with something, tomorrow night you may not get any response at all from it. So it's 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 learning all the time. I'm forever learning. I'll, I don't I don't know any clown that has stopped learning. Now, if anybody says what you do, I don't say. Oh, well, I, I do juggling or I I do uh, balancing or whatever. It's, I'm a clown, and that's it. That's full stop. I learned clowning by watching uh, my older brother Tony, which was uh, Chilo the Clown, watching him perform with a gentleman called Joe Bacall. And uh, Joe Bacall was actually the first clown to ever put makeup onto my face. And it was a very zinky, uh, smelly clown makeup. So if I smell zinc or anything like that, even 25 years later, I think of that situation in his caravan. <laughs> oh, I feel like Elvis. Yeah. <laughs> Most people would open a box and they would take a present out of it or something like that. Where a clown would be there and he would, you know, he would get a big, find a way to get a big blow up elephant out of it or, mm. you know, so he, he does not see everything the same as the average human being would. He sees life from a different point totally of view. Totally different, yeah. It's like classic. It is, it is, yeah. it's classic. If you paint the smile of a clown onto your face, you always have a smile, even if you want to do a sad bit. So you need something that has, you know, something that shows a hint of a smile, but also by changing your facial expressions, it will change your makeup as well. What's your name, darling? Rosita. Rosita. A veritable flower. 
come and sit on my lap, Rosita. <laughs> if I was Keith Richards, I live without regret. If I was Keith Richards, I'd even outlive death. If I was Keith Richards, you'd light my cigarette because my nails are wet. If I was, if I was Keith Richards, I'd drink up all your wine if I was Keith Richards. Need another line If I was Keith Richards You'd do my runs for me And get my drugs for free If I was If I Keith Richards You catch me when I fall If I was Keith Richards There'd be no consequence at all If I was Keith Richards I'd be defying gravity Up in a coconut tree has the right sense of tragedy, is it then easy to become a clown? Uh, no. You cannot uh, learn. You can't tell somebody, no, you go in there now, put her that nose on, and uh, be funny. I think uh, they have to study, watch little children, and see what they laugh about, and that takes years, I think. The Theatre Royal Hobart, built in 1834, is Australia's oldest continuing contemporary working theatre. Noel Coward called it a dream of a theatre. Sir Laurence Olivier described it as the best little theatre in the world. Dame Sybil Thorndike, Max Reddy, Roy Ream, Mo, Mo, Mo stood on the stage. Barry Humphreys, Marcel Marceau, Googie Withers, Michael Redgrave, the beautiful Judith Durham, Hugo Weaving and Kate Blanchett have all stood and performed and acted on this stage. The Theatre Royal officially opened in March 1837 with a production of Speed the Plough, lit by whale oil lamps. Since then it's been the home of cockfights, boxing matches, concerts, religious meetings, the odd fellows, political rallies, dramas, comedies, musicals, and Howard's performing bears. It's caught fire, gone broke, fallen in decay, been remodeled and repurposed countless times in the 19th, 20th, and 21st century. And in fact, 
Right now, it's going through another metamorphosis. My Holden forebears first played the Theatre Royal in 1897 when Adolphus Holden, a one-legged slack wire and triple bar artist, was discovered by international aerialists, the Americans, the Flying Jordans, who gave him his stage name, Gordon the Great. Now in those days, Hobart was on the international shipping route, and the Flying Jordans came back regularly with Gordon the Great on their all-star vaudeville bill. The climax of that bill was Miss Mamie Jordan, who would find the highest part of the auditorium for her perilous leap for life, in which she would throw herself off to be caught by Lewis Jordan on the flying trapeze below with no net, invariably to a standing ovation. Unbelievable. In 1915, when the Flying Jordans stopped touring, Adolphus Holden introduced the Flying Gordons, late of the Flying Jordans, and also introduced his son, Ernie Holden, as Arizona Billy, the rope-spinning cowboy, and they proceeded to play the Theatre Royal right through to the 1920s as the Flying Gordons. Is it ever acceptable to ride a horse, to own a dog, to teach an animal to do tricks? You be the judge. The Holden Brothers Travelling Circus was mainly a circus using human skills, acrobatics, trapeze, but they did use horses and later on they did use monkeys. Whereas the Ashton Circus was a grand circus. Lions, tigers, elephants. It was a huge, huge circus. And the Ashtons have been really gracious enough to let me delve into their archives. Some of it is circus animals like you're never ever going to see again. That time has passed. It's a controversial subject. It's a big subject. But the circus people, and particularly the Ashtons, the animals are in their life 24 hours a day. Now I'd like to introduce you, and I'm going in the cage as soon as he gets all the lions and lionesses in there, to the world's greatest lion tamer, Captain Fritz Schultz. There he is. <laughs> Captain Schultz, you're uh, a well-known name in Australian circus. How long have you been with Ashton? Uh, well, it's going to be 12 years this coming Christmas. And how long have you been training animals? Since 1928. When you're with these wild animals, do you ever feel completely safe? No, no. That would be a mistake if I would so. There's always danger, is there? Definitely. As long as those animals are in there and you can see them snarling and, and fighting, there is always that point that one day they'll break through. Many people are critical of the fact that these uh, wild jungle animals are kept in cages and fairly cramped conditions. So, uh, What do you say about this? Well, first of all, those animals are born in captivity. When an animal is born in captivity, well, it doesn't know the liberty. As well as working lions, you also work uh, the elephants. Which would you say is the more intelligent? Oh, far more the elephants. Oh, far better. The elephant stands... The elephant is one of the most intelligent subjects under the animal kingdom. And what's the difference in training? Oh, uh, I will say you could lead an elephant into a trick and eventually uh, he will not uh, more or less see it as a trick or as a, as a stunt. He will do it with pleasure. Would you like to be an elephant in the circus? In the circus, in the circus. Would you like to be an elephant in the circus? Or go berserkus in the zoo? Would you rather spend your life out on a silver road? Or walk around? Monkey or two. And that was aim and 
what do we think how in the future how the show will be in the, in the next uh, century. I, I think it'll be the same but different. Will the elephant be there in 50 years? Well, the one's here, won't, but... How long do they live? Till they're about 70. Is that right? Well, this one is 64, so... Of course, they live much longer in yeah, captivity. Yeah. Do they? Yeah, well, they better look after, for one thing. Uh, no predators, and better medical, and better food, and more staple diet. Gee, that's, that's the best way to treat animals, is having them in contact. You have closer contact with our animals over a a longer period of time than, than zoos do. Would you like to be a rhinoceros on safari? In the Kalahari, on safari. Would you like to be a rhino on safari? With a Swahili or two. Would you lie down on the belly to the man of the bar? Or would you wake up one day with a missing horn? How'd you like to win a battle star on a beach show? Or to get the wear of the zoo? The main technique of uh, training animals is you've got to be kind, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, to make them do their tricks, you must reward them. And uh, we find that uh, right across the board, whether it be monkeys or ponies or lions, you must be kind, you can't be aggressive. If they do something wrong, uh, you can't get upset. Well, they're friends and uh, I respect them. I think they will respect me. That's the most important. And how did you learn about elephants? Well, I learned here. When I come here, all I used to do, I used to be in the horses, I used to do whips, I used to do handstands, I used to do all different things except elephants. And uh, I used to have a, I used to like them all the time. And uh, I used to go and watch them every night, every night. And I asked Captain Shoot for a few hints, you know, how to, because he's the one trying these ones, really, Abu and Gigi, you know. And he gave me a few hints and all day, you know. But how I get into it was funny. Philip Sakini said to me if I can work there for a couple of weeks until he goes holiday. I said, well, I have a go. And he never come back. I stuck to them since then. That's I mean that's how I got stuck to them, you know. I was lucky because the elephant is pretty used to just one people, you know. If they take you, you're lucky. If you know, they let you know. But you go, we go some places in Australia, some of the towns. People never saw an elephant, never saw a tiger or a lion. Kid, never. First time in their life, you know what I mean? The whip is only to show, it doesn't crack at all. It's just a uh, small whip, you know, it's just like popcorn when it pops. But you need something to show a little bit, you know. I can work them with nothing, really. That's so how do you get them to do things? Just by your voice. Your voice is the most important thing. That's your voice, yeah. You must trust them, they must trust you. That's the, the thing you must work with them together. They got trust in you, believe me. They never forget. Would you like to be an animal in the circus? In the circus, in the circus. Would you like to be an animal in
here and in other circuses, we're the elephant's family. We're the constant things in the circus and that. So the, 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 the continuity of um, affection and emotion and understanding is continuous. There's no broken threads. They're born in the show. You rear them in the caravan. If the mother discards them, yeah, yeah. you take them and hand raise them. And, and you do it just like a baby. You, you watch over them, you give them their feeds how many hours, you change, you put a little nappy on them to sort of, uh, you know, to keep them clean. You wipe them, <laughs> they're behind and do everything that um, yeah. you, you do for a baby. Look, 150 years. It did. Nothing could be more constant than 150 years of a bit of business. What's the wildest on, thing that's happened with an elephant, do you think? Get over here. The only thing I had was half oh. north. She took off to the sugar cane. And we couldn't find her for three days. Oh, and we hired aeroplanes, we hired four wheel drives to look for it. You lost an elephant? We lost an elephant. And she was just, the tail was there, the sugar cane there. And that's why she was right there, because she doesn't move. When she goes inside, you can't see anything. And she just stays there. And we go look all over the bloody place for the elephant, you know? And the next day, you know, a couple of days, she come out straight back. It was like they blow up, you know. She was so full, unbelievable, because the sugar, you know. Man, that's the wild thing happened to me, you know. Anybody that comes with a circus, that they may not like circuses when they join, but they go away. And they always seem to come back with, say, well, they got sawdust in their shoes. Before my dad died, his willies, I didn't have six months in the circus, then six years in the house, and he died with the circus, my dad and his father. It is a magic that you can't define, really. I never stopped working. We'd go to school, do shows at night. Sometimes we'd do three switches at night. We'd show one theatre, pack up the car, go to another one, another one. They go to school again the next day. <laughs> but it's like farming, you get your bad runs and your good runs. And this last six months has been pretty hard. But lucky we've got a very big family that can sort of um, go without wages for a couple of weeks till things start to pick up again. It's called show business. If you don't show, there ain't no business. <laughs> It's ups and downs. I love the business. From infancy to 80 years old, not one day would I change. I've had a wonderful life. I have in my heart that it will keep going, and I'd like to die thinking that, you know. Keep going on. Some tell the truth, some like to lie. For some, it's just the way. Some live their dreams while others try A little game of sacrifice Some say they're